Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Portman. God bless you, man. Thank the Lord. I do feel very, very honored and privileged to be here with you guys tonight. Wow. What a blessing. What a great move of God we've already felt here. And uh, so, if I understand right, I'm not here to do a mission service. It's just like, right? I'm just... Uh, I, I know we're going to disappoint somebody because somebody, when we were walking in, asked my wife if we were bringing a choir with us. They were, I think, a week ahead of time. And, was, and then I threatened somebody later on and said, I was going to sing. And I promise you, I'm not going to do that. That was just a false threat. We're not going to try to do that. Uh, we're just going to share a little bit of the Lord with you here this evening. And I've, I've, I feel like the Lord's given me a message to share with you. And so it's my honor, my privilege to talk to you for a few minutes here tonight. Um, just let me interrupt this long enough to just say, uh, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Brother Portman, Portman to, for, for inviting me. And uh, I failed attempt many, many years ago. We tried to proselytize Courtney many years ago. We, we got her as far as our school. She came to our school some years ago, and we just couldn't get her to come from, you know, but... So that didn't work, so, uh, uh, but we're really, really glad to see, uh, to be with Brother Sister Portman here tonight. And, and then uh, I also want to say I'm really glad to have my wife with me. It's her birthday tomorrow. Uh, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. We sang these songs. We were nothing, nothing less than inspired by the Holy Ghost. I kid you not. Thank the Lord. It's so incredible how the Holy Ghost works and how he ministers. And uh, song leaders are just a gift. And song leaders that pray and, and are, are, are sensitive to the Holy Ghost as to what songs they pick, that is a gift. Amen. That, that song, I used to worry when we sang that last song that you guys sang, the, the chorale sang. And I, I worry about redundancy. Um, and then we're singing, he is for you, he is for you. And it feels a little bit, oh, come on, just let, let, you know, we just keep saying the same words. But I, I've come to believe we can't sing that enough. We need to know that he is for us. And if, if you don't do anything else, just wake up tomorrow morning and just recite those lines over and over again before you go to work. Before you go down to get your coffee in the morning, just remind yourself, he is for me. He is not against me. He is for me. He is for you. And then on this, well, it's a very, very special day. It's Veterans Day today. And we were singing a song a little while ago, He's the God of the Breakthrough. And in there, there's a line that sings, every battle he has already won. And in respect to that song, and today is Veterans Day, and more so because I felt led of the Holy Ghost to present to you this idea, this message tonight, that there is a warrior in your garden. There's a warrior in the garden. And I want to tell you, I mean, I've, I actually haven't been here with you guys for service for over 17 years, I think. And so... I have learned a lot in 17 years. I'm like, how can I squeeze 17 years into, I don't have any, it's her birthday tomorrow. I'm not going to keep you all night, I promise you. Uh, we, we've got a whole birthday to start to launch early tomorrow morning. I'm not going to keep you too late. But I, 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 I want to share with you a, a, a few thoughts in that, that uh, we challenge is, he is for you. There's a warrior in the garden. Be not afraid. And I want to talk to you and try to convince you. So the problem is, and before we pray and, 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 and your precious patient people sit down, before you do that, I, I, I want to say the problem, I mean, in our nation, there's so many people living in fear, right? Right? So many people living in fear. And that's a problem. I think the greater problem is that there are apostolics that are living in fear. There's only really two responses that we see in fear is fear causes people to um, self-promote or self-protect. 
We promote when we're afraid. We were like, I got to tell you how awesome I am because I'm afraid you don't understand how great I am. And so I got to tell you, I got to tell you, I got to tell you. So I'm afraid, and so I self-promote or, or, or I protect. I, I have to go into protect, protection mode. Why? Because I'm afraid, because I'm afraid. And we see this drawn out in human behavior all the time. And that is not how it should be. And the Lord has given us strength and confidence, and he tells us all the time he is for us. But there's an enemy that's here to tell us and tell you tonight, and maybe even more loudly than all the raised up volume in my microphone can tell you, there's an enemy that would tell you that God is against you. The world is against you. The church is against you. The pastor is against you. Your friends here in the, in the sanctuary are against you. But God is for you. None of them are against you either. Um, and, and even if they were, God is on your side. Amen, amen, amen. So, um, Jesus is coming so soon. He's coming so soon. And so, I feel like the Lord is going to release in you this evening a measure of faith, a greater measure of faith that will give you confidence that he is on your side, he is for you, and you have nothing to fear. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your hand in our lives. And I thank you again, Lord. I thank you for this beautiful church. I thank you, Lord, for Brother and Sister Schumacher. And I thank you for Brother and Sister Portman. And I thank you, Lord, for all of what this church has meant to this uh, community and to, and to us in the state of Wisconsin. I thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done through these great people. But God, I pray tonight in the name of Jesus that they would know of an assurance before they leave here tonight that their faith would be raised, that they would walk out with a confidence knowing that you are on their side and, and that you are there with them every day and that they have nothing to fear. There is no need to fear because you are the warrior that is in our garden. And so I pray tonight, Lord, that you would strengthen every heart here. And, and I don't have to ask you to be here, Lord. You are already here. But I pray, Lord, that your spirit would be made manifest in every life and every heart and every mind here tonight. In the name of the Lord, be strong here tonight. Convince us tonight uh, assuredly that you are our God, that you are faithful, that you are strong, Lord, that you are able to bring us through. In Jesus' name, thank the Lord. Bless the word and bless every ear that would hear tonight in the great name of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So you look at your neighbor and just tell them that God is for you, and then you can be seated. I, I, I felt while we were singing that I, I, I needed to just remind you, and I, I, I don't, I'm not going to go from Genesis to Revelation, although I'm very tempted, but uh, I, I would start enough in Genesis just to tell you that, that uh, whenever you feel like you've failed, and whenever you feel like you, you're not enough, and whenever you feel like maybe you're, you're, you, you've dropped the ball on your Christian walk, that you should always go back to the garden and, 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 and recognize if, at, if, if nothing else speaks to you there, which there's so much life in that garden. But if you go back to the garden and you understand that, that when Adam and Eve fell, Everybody say they fell. I mean, they fell magnificently. I mean, they really, really failed. And when they failed, they did not run to the altar and pray through. They did not call out to God for help. They went and hid themselves away from God. And while they were hiding, lo and behold, there was a warrior in the garden that came looking for them. They failed, and he came looking for them. They failed. They didn't have a pastor or a preacher or a visiting evangelist or anybody to come by and tell them, hey, you should pray through. They didn't have any of that available. They went and hid behind a bush. And who came looking for them? They were not worthy. They had failed miserably. And in the midst of their failure, in the midst of their misunderstanding, in the midst of their weakness, God came looking for them. We think, well, I'm not so spiritual. I'm not just right. I haven't done everything I should have done. I have taken a little bit too much Christian liberty. <laughs> and 
And so because I have taken too much liberty, God must not care about me anymore. God's not worried or concerned about me. But if he would come looking for those original sinners, he will come looking for you. And again, I would tell you, he is on your side. Amen? Why don't you, if you have a Bible or an electronic version thereof, why don't you open up with me to Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 1. And in the King James translation, it reads like this. It says, but now thus saith the Lord. (laughs) Can I just say that God is still speaking. He was speaking to Isaiah And he was speaking before Isaiah, he was speaking to Isaiah, and he is speaking to you here tonight. I'm not talking about the sound of the preacher, I'm talking about God speaking to you. No, I'm not worthy for God to speak to me. No, no, I'm not worthy for God to speak to me, but I know that we are serving a God that still speaks. And if he would speak to and reach out to Adam and Eve in the midst of their failure, he will and he is speaking to you. Thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob. Check this out. Thus saith the Lord that created. Everybody say created. Thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. Everybody say formed. And he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. Everybody say fear not. I'm going to work you pretty hard tonight. Everybody say fear not. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by thy name. Thou art mine. <laughs> Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. I love that. I want to read the whole, a couple more verses there. I don't really need to read the rest of this, but it's just too, too beautiful to pass on. When thou passeth through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow thee. Do you remember that song we were just singing? Uh, that he will bless you in the field. He will bless you in the house. He will bless you in your coming. He will bless you in your going, right? right? And, and through the rivers, they will not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Neither shall I, uh, the flame kindle upon thee. Uh, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I, have, I gave Egypt your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved you. Therefore will I give men for thee and, my, and people for your life. Again, fear not. Everybody say, fear not. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring you seed from the east, and I will gather you from the west. In other words, God is seeking after you. He is a God. We're singing that song in Deuteronomy 28. It it, it paints this incredible picture. I remember Brother John Grant, our our former, uh, while uh, years ago, he was our district superintendent standing at the campgrounds and saying, you know, you know the sensation. This is from Deuteronomy 28. You know that sensation when you see the squad car pulling in behind you, and you think, oh my goodness, you you check yourself. I was driving a little bit too fast fast he's got his lights on and and you feel that kind of sinking feeling in your heart and and you start to pull over by the side of the road and you take this big breath of relief as the cop drives past you and oh he was he wasn't chasing me and this is this is the promise of the lord he said he said brother grant said it's just like that but the opposite. God is chasing you down, not to give you a ticket. God will chase you down to give you a blessing. And that, that, that's what we're singing, right? That, that's what we're seeing here. He says, he says I am, I'm going to be with you in good times and bad times, in the fire, in the, in, in the river. It's not going to overwhelm you in the flood. You know, nothing, you've got nothing to fear. Why? Because I am your God and I am with you. I love the... Uh, the cadence, the rhythm, the, 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 the synchronicity of that uh, first scripture there. And you, and you go back, and, and we, most of us that study the word, we, we know about the first usage. You go back and you always look at where the first time a word was used. And when you look at, at, at that opening scripture there, it says, For uh, now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob. And you go back and say, well, when was the word created uh, first used? Well, that was Genesis 1 and 1. You've got right there the opening, uh, the opening of the word created. He, God, God created the earth. He created, created, created. He's, he's a God that creates, amen? And, and so he created, he, he created. This is how God created the world. He, he spoke it into existence. And then when he got to man, he didn't just speak, he formed. He said, I created thee, Jacob. I formed thee, Israel. Created thee, 
formed thee. And he said, I called you by name. Jacob uh, comes from this, the, this sense of, we see here that God created, uh, created the earth. He created uh, all the sky, the stars, the moon, all of what we see, the mountains, the majesty of the, uh, of the, of the mountains, of the, of the rivers, of the sea. And he created all of that. And then he formed mankind. And then mankind comes along and many, many generations later, Jacob is born. And Jacob is given that name from mankind. Mankind gives Jacob that name. And God says, I created thee, Jacob, but I formed you, Israel. And, and, and if you track that, if you watch that, you see that, that Jacob received his name from his parents. Well, that makes sense. Okay, that's paper. Yeah, I don't, nobody's writing that down. That's just kind of a given, right? Jacob received his name from his parents. They, uh, they, 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 they gave birth to him, and God says, I created thee, O Jacob. But he says, I formed thee, O Israel, and I have called thee by thy name. His parents named him Jacob. God named him Israel created, I formed, I called you by a new name, I gave you the name of Israel. It doesn't matter what everybody else called you. It doesn't matter what your name uh, invokes. As a matter of fact, the name Jacob, I can't understand what the parents were thinking because the name Jacob meant supplanter, it meant trickster, it meant fooler, it, it meant person that was going to take people, take advantage of people, and God comes along while everybody else had labeled Jacob one way. God comes along and gives Jacob a whole new identity. They called you this, I am going to call you Israel. I'm going to call you Israel. Israel means God prevails. You have wrestled with me and you have prevailed. But in your prevailing, in your wrestling, uh, uh, God is seen as prevailing through the wrestling that you did. You chased after me. You, you wrestled with me. And this is what God is calling us to. He's saying, come on, have a wrestling match with me. Come on, don't give up. Grab a hold of me and don't let go. Don't, don't just turn around and walk away. Seek after me and and. and and, and this goes back to, uh, and he said, he said, I have called thee by name. He's speaking. He's calling. And I believe he's speaking to you. And he's calling you. And this takes us back to Deuteronomy 6.4. It, it, it's one of our quintessential scriptures, right? It's one of our foundational beliefs. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And almost, almost all of you have a, a familiarity with that scripture. But I think we get so focused on the, on the oneness of God there, which is paramount in its importance. But we skip one of the most evident things there is hear, O Israel. In other words, hear, H-E-A-R. That's not hear, O Israel. Here you are, Israel. It's here, O Israel. Listen, tune in. I am speaking to you. What am I speaking to you about? I'm speaking to you about I am one. There is only one God. I'm speaking to you through that oneness to call you by who I say you are. Forget what the rest of the world calls you. Even forget what your parents called you. Forget what your neighborhood friends and, the, and that bully at school called you. Forget about all of that. I have called you. I, they created you, but I have formed you. I ch I'm challenging you. I'm giving you something new. I'm giving you something fresh. I'm giving you something from the one that authored your life, the one that created all that you know and see. I have called you to something higher and something better. I called you to something that will speak uh, a, a, a strength to you and will speak strength to you and speak new identity to you. In other words, do not fear because I am with you. Not just hear, hear me, listen, I'm calling you. You know, somebody counted, I'm not, I'm not big on this kind of mathematical equation, but somebody, it's, it is said that there are 365 fear knots in the Bible. You guys are all so smart, you're already a mile ahead of me. You know that means that there's a fear knot for every day. Fear not. Fear not. Do not be afraid. Why? Do not be afraid because I am God is with us. Amen? 1 Timothy 1 and verse 6 says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. 
For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but God has given us power and of love and of a sound mind. The spirit of God doesn't come to make us afraid. The spirit of God comes to give us power. Everybody say power. Power of love and of a sound mind. God is calling you and has brought you in to this thing, into this moment, into this uh, area of your life, not to see you fail, not to leave you abandoned behind some bush of failure after you have done something that you deem as wrong. God has not called you to see you fail. He is coming to speak to you no matter where you are, no matter what you have done. The God of all creation is here tonight speaking to you. I love you. I want to give you a sound mind. I don't want you to be afraid. I haven't come to give you the spirit of fear. That's coming from somewhere else. What are you, we, what are you, and you go ahead and ask me, Steve, what are you afraid of? I don't guess Brother Portman did a great job of introducing me. I don't guess I even told you who I am. It doesn't really matter. My name is Steve. I, I do pastor a church, but that's not really who I am, more of who I am. I'm the husband of that beautiful woman in the front. I was born into an apostolic home. I walked away from God while God was offering me everything, and, and I had no business doing so, but I turned my back on God, and out in the middle of the wilderness, a long ways away from God, God came and reached for me. He brought me back in. I promised my girlfriend that I wouldn't be a preacher, and then God converted us both, and I became a preacher, and here she sits uh, helping me preach and pastor anyway, and, and all of that. Probably the most important thing that you need to know about me is I've got the Holy Ghost. It's the same spirit in me that's alive in you that gave me life and restored me and resurrected me. It's the same power that's alive in you. <laughs> Having been in this, well, well nigh under 60 years now, a little bit more. Having been in this all of my life, other than a couple of years straying away and some foolishness in my youth. Been around this for a long time. And, uh, well, I know that there are apostolics. I know that what goes on in the world has a strange way of creeping into the church. The world is afraid, and far too many apostolics are afraid. What, what are the fears that we face? You know, I, I, we, we're not facing right now, we're not living in Ukraine and we have friends, we literally have friends that live in Ukraine. They have a whole different level of fear than you and I have, but our fear is very palatable, it's very real, it's very tangible. We feel it. We, 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 we lay awake at night worrying about things. What are you afraid of? We're afraid to be embarrassed. We're afraid we're going to fail. If I were to say... Uh, how many of you feel like there's just not enough time in the day? Anybody ever feel that? Not as many as I expected. How many have a fear of telling the truth? <laughs> how many ever hear that voice that speaks to you in the middle of the night that says that you are not enough? I don't have enough time. I am not good enough. I am not measuring up. I'm afraid I'm going to be rejected. I'm afraid I'm going to be alone. I'm, going to, I'm afraid of poverty. I'm afraid of sickness. I'm even afraid of death. Think about that. Here we are, the children of the Most High God, who has conquered death, hell, and the grave. And we are afraid of the very thing that he came and promised us we would never have to fear. Everyone, everyone I know is facing fear. John 20 and verse 15 says, Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, 
Sir, if you have borne him hence, if you've taken him someplace, tell me where you have taken him. Tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. We see this beautiful portrait of, of Mary of Magdalene come and, 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 and looking for Jesus in the tomb. And, and, and she gets there and realizes that Jesus is not where she was expecting him to be and 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 she's afraid that she has lost her loved one she is afraid that she has lost the one that has offered her everything and changed her and changed her everything and she's afraid that she's lost him and and she looks to him supposing him to be the gardener. Now, that's just one of the most amazing uh, portraits of Jesus that I can see. Uh, I love that. I love that he was this warrior slash gardener. He, 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 he was talking with Adam and Eve in the garden. He was seeking his own. He was seeking those that he loved that had failed him in the garden. And, and here's this woman that's coming looking for him and she has a level of expectation of where to find him and, and how he and the condition that he is that she is going to find him in and is totally unprepared for him to have done what he had said he was going to do. And here she is staring him in the face but she doesn't even recognize that it's the Lord, the one that she has given her life to, she doesn't even recognize him, and she supposes him to be the gardener. In John 8, we see this story of of a woman that's uh, that's caught in the act of adultery, and there's so many different directions we could go with that, right? But 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 the important thing to to, to relevance of what we're talking about this evening is is she's laying there and they're wanting to kill her, and 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 according to the law, they had the right to kill her, and we'll forget about conversations about the men and where they, what where the, their their mindset was and where the man was, where he how he got away. Not important to the, it's very important, but it's not important to the story here. The story goes, though, that Jesus just kneels down and he, and, and he puts his hands in the dirt. And he starts writing in the dirt. And, 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 and in, the, in the dirt uh, that, that we believe that Jesus frequented he he cared about it he had he had formed humanity out of the out of the dirt of the ground and and now he's in the dirt not forming humanity but rescuing humanity and and so he's on his hands and knees he's got his hands down in the dirt and 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 he starts writing something and and literally liberating this woman she he, he's literally liberating this this unrepentant woman she hasn't come to church yet. She hasn't accepted the Lord as her own personal Savior yet. She certainly hasn't spoken in tongues. She's done none of that. And in the midst of her sin, Jesus reaches down into the dirt of the earth and starts writing different things. And, and, and because of his penmanship, I don't know, was it his penmanship? I, I don't know what it was that he was, I don't, I don't know if it was his penmanship or what it was that he was writing, but whatever he put down there in the dirt caused the accusers, caused the men that were so eager and ready to destroy her when they saw what he was doing when they saw his hands in the garden they dropped their rocks and walked away now here we got mary seeing this man and she supposes that he is the gardener Maybe because she's seen him with his hands dirty before. Maybe she's seen him uh, uh, tilling uh, the soil and the dirt of somebody else's life other than hers. And she knows that he is capable of completely transforming a life because he's willing to get his hands dirty out of his love and his compassion for those that have failed and those that have fallen. Yet we have this idea, we have this thought that we have to be perfect before he will speak to us life is like a garden right i'm not much of a gardener i get to help my wife every now and then with hers but life is like a garden if for no other reason it's because you will always reap what you sow a gardener is completely different than a florist a florist 
plants trees, plants flowers, grows flowers so that they can sell them and make a profit. Picture Jesus as the gardener that's tilling the soil just to grow what he loves. He's not growing it for business. He's not growing it to prosper himself. He's tending to the plants. He's tending to the soil. He's growing them not for someone else. He's growing them for himself because you are his. And I want to tell you, you are enough. That didn't get a single amen. <laughs> you are enough. He's looking at you as not a disposable waste of time. He's looking at you worthy of investing his life and sacrificing himself for. He deemed you worthy. All these songs that we sing and things that we say about we're not worthy, that's not coming from God. Because God has deemed you worthy. Worthy of getting his hands dirty. Worthy of stripes on his back. Worthy of spears in his side. Worthy of thorns crushed into his forehead. He has deemed you worthy and he has put in the work in order to rescue and redeem you. I, I challenge you today to remind you that there is a warrior in your garden and he's tending to your life because he cares so fervently about you. There is a warrior in the garden. Do not be afraid. She's standing there, not recognizing her Savior, not realizing that he has already defeated everything that she is afraid of. And I would tell you tonight that he has already defeated everything that you are afraid of. Jesus is the warrior and he has defeated death, hell, and the grave. So what are you afraid of? Are you afraid of aloneness? He would say, fear not, for I am with you. <laughs> are you afraid that you'll be exposed as a fraud? Fear not. I already know who you are, and I love you anyway. You afraid you'll be rejected? Fear not. I searched for Adam and Eve, and I did not give up on them, and I will not give up on you. Are you worried about poverty? Are you worried about sickness? Are you worried about death? I want to tell you that Jesus Christ is here. Why? Because he has given himself. He's conquered death, hell, and the grave, and he cares about you. He has already defeated everything that the devil could possibly throw at you. The Lord has already defeated everything that you could fear. Ephesians 6 and 11 says, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor. Life is like a garden. Your mind is like a garden. You will grow what you feed it. You feed it fear you will grow more fearful. You feed it hope, and you will come to life. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Take Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. I want to tell you that the battle is not out there. The battle is right here. You wake up and you feel or you hear these voice, this voice speaking to you. I mean, what, what does the devil speak to you at night? I don't hear a voice. No, I'm not talking about just a voice. There's that inner thing and that feels like us. Sometimes we're not sure, is that God speaking to us or the devil speaking to us? You know something, Brother Portman, that I found out that most, I'm cushion my words here and be a little bit careful, but I, 
I, I think I have discovered that among apostolics, most people think that the devil will speak to us more frequently than, than God will. We, we, we think God will only speak to us if we're living just right. We think we have to kind of earn our way into the voice of God. And this is just simply not provable in the scripture. It's not provable in, 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 what, God, in what God has given us in, in our example of who he is and how he loves us. I'm not, I'm not giving you a right to sin. I, I'm not even going to try to qualify all that. This, this is not about that. This is about a God that loves you so intensely that he will never stop reaching for you. Okay, so, so, so we feel like, so how do we qualify if God is speaking to us? I mean, you know, you know we pray all the time. And, and, uh, and I know about you guys. You guys do pray. You pray a lot. Thank God for that. That's awesome. Prayer is so fundamental. It, 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 it's, so in, it, it's, it's paramount in, in our walk with God. We, we have to, we, we must, we, we have to have a prayer life. Amen? And, and, and so we pray, but yet we pray, but most of the time we don't really take time to let God speak to us. And, and, and if somebody comes up and says, hey, Jesus told me, Da, 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 da. We like get kind of weirded out like a second. And, and, and you know why that is? Because, because there have been so many frauds around us. There, there, there have been so many people that have, that, that, that have uh, you know, misspoken. And, and they've said stuff that, that just clearly wasn't from God. I mean, you, do you need some examples or do you know? You've already got that. You, you, you remember that, right? You remember what that so-and-so said and, and, and what that was. And, you, and they said it was God and you knew it wasn't God. And, and, and so because they said it was God, well, then you start worrying about whether or not I should say it's from God. Because, because we worry that we, we, well, wait a second, wait a second. We're, we're worried, we're afraid of all these different things. But God is coming here 365 times a day. Uh, 365, well, if you want to read the whole thing. But, 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 but 365 times uh, God has given us in his word, fear not. Don't be afraid. The, the, devil, the devil doesn't count, counterfeit fake stuff. He only counterfeits the real. So if you're like, I'm never doing anything because uh, I'm never doing anything that could be counterfeit. Well, then give me your $100 bills. All, I'll take all your $100 bills tonight because $100 bills are counterfeited all the time. But yet you still carry them and you use them. I don't want your ones. I'll take your hundreds uh, because, uh, because they're frequently counterfeited. You know why? Because they're real. And the only thing God will counterfeit is a fraud. Or I mean, I'm mean, sorry, the only thing the devil will counterfeit is, is something that God will do for real. And, and, and as apostolic in this world that we live in, because only because Jesus is coming so soon, the apostolic world needs to become familiar with his voice. We pray and we anticipate a word in response. We pray and we expect God to speak. We don't, how, how foolish of an exercise is prayer if we're not expecting an answer. So when we speak to God, we expect God to speak to us. He is fighting for you. He is reaching for you. He is, I dare say, he is even speaking to you. He's calling you. He's, he's challenging you. Now, the problem is that he doesn't always say. As a matter of fact, he seldom says what we want him to say. <laughs> amen, amen. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. Where we walk in the flesh, we do not war against the flesh, right? right? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, uh, but mighty in God, pulling down the strongholds, casting down arguments, and, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity uh, to the obedience of Christ. Why? Because God is working on uh, our, he's working on our mind, he's speaking to us in our heart, he's challenging us to grow into what he has called us to be. He has planted his seed into our life that we can grow in the garden of, of his uh, kingdom, in the garden of, of his economy, that we can be the church that God has called us to be. And, and, and because there's this thing that Jesus said, he said, uh, my sheep know my voice. I've come here tonight to tell you that God is speaking. And I'm going to challenge you tonight to listen to his voice. 
Jesus is here. The warrior in your garden is here. And we see him with his hands in our dirt. Come on, preacher, leave me alone. Come on, pastor. Come on, Brother Portnum. Don't get in my, don't, don't get in my business anymore. And, and, and we feel the tug of God on our hearts when, when the preacher is preaching. We feel the tug of God in our heart when, when we read the word and when we feel the Holy Ghost calling us to step out by faith and to, and to do something new and, and, to cha- and to try something that we haven't tried before. Well, I want to tell you that is probably the voice of God because God is seldom going to tell you, oh, just stay in the green pastures. Just sit and rest in the pew. He's going to pull you forward into something new. I don't want the valley of the shadow of death any more than any of you do. But God always pulls us into something new. And so when you feel that challenge uh, to, uh, well, let's just go ahead and make a little plug for missions when we you feel that challenge to give a little more to missions than you feel like you can afford let me tell you the devil's never going to tell you to do that when you feel that challenge in your heart to to witness to your friend the devil's never going to tell you to do that oh i don't know god i don't i don't know if that's you god I, you might that you know that might be embarrassing maybe that's the devil going to try to humiliate me the devil's never going to tell you to share your testimony That's the Holy Ghost. That's the voice of the Lord calling you to do something. It might cause you to fear rejection. Well, your your response might be carnal, but we are not wrestling against flesh and blood. We are calling, God is calling us into doing something new. And he's pulling us into something greater. He says to her, he says, why are you weeping? In John chapter 20, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? Jesus says to her, uh, Jesus says to her in verse 16, Mary, and when she hears her name spoken across those lips, he speaks to her, and she knows it is him. And I want to tell you, he is speaking to you tonight. Do not be afraid. Do not worry. That worry that fear, Sister Nona Freeman stood in our church many, many years ago and said, that worry that's just a dog chasing its tail. It's just, it's never going to resolve anything. The devil's just going to keep you spinning and running in circles all that he can. That's not coming from the Lord. That fear, that worry, he doesn't plant seeds of fear. He doesn't plant seeds of worry. He's come to give you strength and liberty and to set you free. The weeds that Jesus is in your garden trying to pull out, the weeds are are the lies that we've been believing about ourselves, the fears that we've carried with us, maybe from elementary school, maybe all of our lives we've had these fears that were planted in us, and God is here tonight to pull those weeds out of your life, to set you free from those things that you've battled for years. God is able, he's the only one that is able to really fix this. How does he fix it? First, you got to recognize he is the warrior in the garden. She's standing there. She doesn't even recognize it's Jesus, but he's already defeated death, hell, and the grave. And he's the warrior in your garden. That battle has already been won. Second, uh, uh, John, John chapter seven. Sorry, John chapter seven and verse thirty-seven. On the last day of the great, uh, uh, the, on the last day, uh, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, "If anybody's thirst, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink." And he who believes in me, and in the, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He comes. To water your garden. How does he fix this? We think it's about coming to an altar on a Sunday night and telling God that we're sorry for all of our wrongs. <laughs> I'm not at Elam, so I got to be careful here. Um, but repentance is not about saying you're sorry. I'm just, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just going to say this. Repentance is not about saying you're sorry. As a matter of fact, I, I most time I don't even know why we say sorry. Like, like if I tell you uh, I'm I'm sorry, and you're like, oh, it's okay. I, I don't even know what that exchange m- meant. 
Like, did you, were you somehow waiting on me to feel sorrowful for what I had done? Like, like, like something really bad. Let's say somebody stabs you. I mean, not, 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 uh, uh, you know, not just as an example. I mean, but really metal, steel blade into your back. And they come back and they say, I'm sorry. And you say, okay, well, okay, I'm glad you feel bad about what you just did. Does that, does that change anything? It doesn't change anything. Listen, God is not sitting in his throne up in heaven waiting for you to feel sorry or feel bad about what you've done. Repentance is about change. Repentance is not about, oh, God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I mean, godly sorrow leadeth to repentance. It, it, it's, it, may, it might start with sorrow, but it doesn't end there. It, it's recognizing that I have done wrong, and I'm sorry that I stabbed you in the back. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going I'm to take you to the hospital and, 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 and help you get fixed. Well, well that's, that's repentance. I'm not doing that anymore. And, and, and so... So, so how does God fix this? It, it, it's not about saying you're sorry. It's about transformation. It's about lives change. It's about attitudes uh, being transformed. It's like, I, I recognize what I have done, and I don't want to do those things anymore. I want to be healed. Anybody want to be healed here tonight? Jesus came in Mark 1 and 15 saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. It's repent, that's turn, make a change. It's determined you're not going to do those wrong things anymore. He's not looking for you to say your story. He's looking for you to recognize what it is that's damaging you. It's, it's recognizing the weeds that are in your garden and saying, God, go ahead and take that stuff out. Go ahead and transform me. Go ahead and change me into who you want me to be. So repentance is about this metaneo. It's, it's to think differently or, or afterwards to reconsider how you have done. And, and so repentance becomes, it becomes necessary. Okay, one, one more apostolic uh, thing that I've noticed. And, and then I'll let you go home. Um, repentance is about honesty. Okay, I've said it. <laughs> okay, Lord, I said it. All right, all right. So repentance is about, it's about confession. It's, it's about confessing what you have done wrong. Not, not in front of a group of accountability partners. It's just, it's just recognizing, God, this is not working. Like, like can you really, uh, just, just in your own prayer time, can you, can you really be honest with God? I, I, I th th think about this. Think about this. So many people are not. I mean, of course you are, but, but you know, think about the poor slob next to you, right? Uh, I, I mean, they're praying all the time, but they never really admit where they are or where they're not. It's like, it's like God, I, I don't like that you're not answering my financial problems. I mean, can you go to God and say, you promised to take care of these needs, yet you don't seem to be take, taking care of these needs. Can you be honest with God? I, th th this is the craziest thing. Brother Portman, this, I, I don't understand how we've gotten here. But it's like we hide things from our, in our heart from the only one that knows everything that's already in our heart. And all that God is waiting for, not to say, hey, I'm sorry, I don't understand. I'm sorry, I don't like all this. I'm sorry. It, 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 it's, it, we're, we're not being honest with God. But when you become honest with God and you confess what's in your heart, uh, understand, God cannot work in your life with your, in your dishonesty. He can only work where you are honest with him. And so when you confess what's going on, when, you're con when you confess what your problem is, when you confess what your weakness is, when, when you confess your disbelief, I don't know. I don't know if I can walk on water. Well, just go ahead and step out. I, I don't know if I can really do these things. Well, just go ahead and try. Just trust me. Listen, by your honesty, you're not going to build a wall between you and God. We've already seen God coming through all of the deception and the fear and the lies and the failure and reaching for Adam and Eve. He is searching for somebody here that will tell him the truth. Tell him the truth about who you really are. God, I, 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 I can't measure up to what I feel like everybody wants me to be. I, 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 I felt like a failure all of my life. My, 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 my school teacher told me I was stupid, and so I've always felt stupid. I, I, don't, I don't know, wherever it is, whatever it is in your life, we have to open up our hearts and confess those things. And when we confess and when we are honest, God can then start working 
in the soil of our life. And, and he can pull out those weeds. And I don't care how deep those roots go. God is able to get to the root of every problem in your heart, every problem in your mind, every problem in your life. But you have to be the one because he's never going to do it against your will. So you have to confess who you are and where you feel that you are or where you feel that you aren't or, or, or what you feel about God. I, I know that you bless my pastor, but I don't think you'll bless me in the way that you bless my I, I know that you'll bless senior pastor and look at what you've done in their life, but why, 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 why won't you do that in my life? And, and until you confess where you really are and what you really feel with God, you're going to always live with the weed of that, with the, the, the weeds in your garden that you're just protecting and you're fearful and we live so afraid. I want to tell you there's a warrior in your garden and he is not afraid of your mess. He's not turned off by your failure. Matter of fact, it's just calling him to, 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 to reach for you a little bit more and one more time, one more Sunday night, there's a, uh, there's a preacher saying, go ahead and open up and pour your heart out to God and be honest with him. And in your honesty, you will find a God that will meet you in the garden of your life. And that's when transformation happens. So we just asked Jesus, who do you say I am? I know what the world says about me. I know what those kids down the block used to call me. I know what the guy sitting over there, I think I know what they think about me. And the devil will tell you all kinds of crazy things in order to get you to close up and shut down and self-protect. And we wind up protecting the weeds in our life. And God is wanting to transform your garden into one that represents the kingdom of glory. Amen. Why don't you stand with me tonight? Oh, thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. There's a warrior in your garden. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Is there anybody here that really wants to be transformed tonight? What, what, what about this? What about this? Is there anybody here that wants that? that is there anybody that wants to be healed tonight? Does anybody need healing in their body? Wow, all kinds of people need healing in their body. Amen. 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 There's a warrior in your garden. He's not afraid of your disease. He's not afraid of your weakness. He's not afraid of your injury. Oh, thank the Lord. I, I had uh, some really bad back issues a week ago, week two Tuesdays ago. I literally embarrassed the living daylights out of myself. I fell to my hands and knees. I'm sorry, Brother Portman, I think you've already heard this, but I fell on my hands and knees uh, in my daughter's living room. I was putting down a, a, my grandson, my youngest one. He's like just a sack of air. I mean, he doesn't weigh anything. He's like 50, not even 15 pounds, I don't think. And I was holding him, and I bent over to put him down. That was fine. But when I stood back up, it literally felt like what I was just describing. It literally felt like someone had shoved a piece of metal, a knife, up into my side. And I couldn't stand up. I fell down to the ground. And, uh, and uh, now this is crazy. This is crazy. This is me listening to the voice of the Lord right now. I wasn't, wasn't planning on sharing that tonight. Literally, I've been like trying to avoid talking about it because like for the next three days, like a half a second, how long does it take normally for you to, you know, bend over, stand, not even a second, maybe a half a second to stand back up. That half a second monopolized like three days of my week that week. Uh, totally took me over. I, I mean, I, I, I couldn't move. I couldn't hardly breathe. Every breath was hurting. And, and so, um, <laughs> so this is, this is, this is where... And that old phrase, the rubber meets the road. This is where honesty really happens. Sometimes I don't like this about myself. I just get a little bit too raw, a little bit too honest. And, but uh, um, um, so, you know, my dad calls me the next day after he hears about it. Hey, 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 remember, I've always told that testimony about how I was, uh, you know, on my hands and knees and I had such a back problem and God reached down and healed me instantly. And I've never had those back problems again. I'm like, well, yay, yay, good for you. Thank the Lord. Hey, God, hey, 
Why not me? <laughs> Assistant pastor called me, hey man, I'm sorry. You know, remember a couple summers ago, same thing happened to me, he said. And, uh, I don't remember. It was like he said, I, oh, oh, well, I'm, I'm 60. He's like in his 40s. So this happened back when he was in his late 30s. He falls to the ground at State Fair. That's pretty bad, right? Young guy uh, falls to the ground because his back was about, he's about the same height as I am. And um, this is a long fall, right? It's, uh, um, you know, this is the challenge of being tall. When you fall, it really hits a long ways down. And so Tim falls to the ground on State Fair and Hey, Pastor, remember that, you know, and the man, that was really rough. And boy, it hurt so bad. Never felt such pain in my life. The next day I woke up, I was fine. Like, I'm, I'm already oh, more than 24 hours into this. Hey, God, hey, come on. What's that about? And then the next day I'm still waiting. Okay, well, so I'm like twice as old as Tim was when that happened to him. So maybe it's going to take me two days. Two days later, I'm still hurting. Three days later, I'm still hurting. It's like, I don't understand. I don't understand the economy of God. I cannot, I cannot compartmentalize how God does things for my dad and how God did things for Tim. And come on, come on, where, am, where are you? Why aren't you touching me? Now, some of you might feel like that's sacrilegious. You know what I think is sacrilegious? you've got a great pastor and he can fix anything I say that's wrong but you know what I think is sacrilegious is when we're not honest with the only only one that can see what's really going on in our heart that's just crazy doesn't make sense any sense at all he knows what's there I might this woman she knows me better than any human on the planet and I might be able to fool her for a day or two I don't know but but if I can fool her, it's not for very long. But I can't fool God for a heartbeat. He sees right through all my facade. He sees right through all my religious whatever. He sees through all of that. And it's like, oh, no, I can't. I, no, I can't. I can't say that to you. It's like, really? I'm like, Steve, I'm, I'm looking right at it. It's right there. Just speak that out. Come on. Open up, because if you'll open up to me, I will pour into you. But I cannot heal you. I cannot heal in you what you will not expose to me. Religion has killed more Christians than anything else. Isaiah looked up, he says, I saw the Lord. He is high and lifted up. His train did fill the temple. He's, he looks around the earth. He says, I see his glory everywhere. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Some of you guys are watching Fox News, and all you can see is the woe is me all over the world. Isaiah looked right through all that garbage, and he saw the glory of the kingdom of God everywhere. And you think that darkness is so strong that your light can't shine. Let me tell you, God is breaking right through that, and he is going to use the light inside of you. But he cannot do in you what you will not open up to him. So wherever that leaves you and however that speaks to you, if you want God to heal you, God is here to heal you tonight. You don't have to wait through some long process. Um, God is here to heal you tonight. And so uh, God did heal me. I'm not going to try to do any somersaults, but I couldn't do those. I couldn't do those beforehand anyway. So uh, I, I'm not going to, you know. But God has healed me. I am able to move now, and it took a process of about four or five days. But I feel so much better than I did a week and a half ago. And I'm telling you, it may, it may take a moment. It may take a step. But here's the thing: I waited on the Lord, and He restored me. I trusted in the Lord. And he proved faithful. I listened for the Lord and he began to speak. And tonight I want to pray a prayer of healing over you. And if you want us, your pastor, myself, or anyone else here, 
But if you want us to lay hands on you, we will, and God will meet you right here tonight. God wants to heal. I think if somebody has a back problem, you ought to let me heal, pray for you, and I'll bring God's healing into your body tonight by speaking a word of faith over you. God wants to heal. Is there anybody that needs healing in their back tonight? Let's pray about that. Anybody need a Holy Ghost? Let's pray about that. Anybody need a fresh touch of the Lord or renewal in your spirit? Come on, just be honest and be real and, and, and confess where you are or where you're not and open up and the Lord will meet you in the midst of, of wherever you're, you're hiding or wherever you're fearful. God will meet you right there. God is here tonight to transform and to heal and He is able. He is the warrior that's in your garden.